Okay. All right, there's the green light. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our um, traditional ecological science and management curriculum release party for the junior high school, junior high school <clears throat> age group. Um, thank you all for spending this very fragile evening with us. I know this is really challenging to, to make these things happen, but, you know, I think this definitely sheds light on how important it is to, to dedicate these types of times to our, um, to these things like, um, DEK related curriculum. Um, okay, before we get to our, uh, panelists here, I just wanted to, um, do a little bit of housekeeping, um, if you join, please be sure to have your cameras off. If you're not a panelist, mute obviously is always important for us to make sure it's on. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to start off by introducing myself. And um, my name is Charlie Reed. I'm the education director here at State of California Salmon. Also a Hoopa Yurok Kuduk person. Um, and so I'm very honored to be in this position that I'm in. Uh, you know, on unseated We Out Country here in McKinleyville. Um, and with that, we always like to encourage folks to put that acknowledgement into action and action could even be implementing this curriculum into local schools. Um, and we will be having a series of teachers trainings um, February 4th, 11th and 18th. <clears throat> and we'll be sure to put these links and things in into the chat as throughout the entirety of this segment. And all, as always, I think it was a couple of days, yesterday is Giving Tuesday. So there's definitely, we encourage folks to donate if they can. And there's a lot of resources to kind of educate yourselves and things about the importance of um, centering indigenous people and spaces. With that, I would like to um, start by turning it over to our fellow um, panelists. I just want to personally thank each and every one of you for dedicating time and contributing to this very important narrative. Um, and I'm going to start with actually my dad, Ron Reed, if he'd like to give himself an introduction to this space. I think you're muted, Dad. Okay, thank you. My name's Ron Reed. Um, I'm a Kaduk tribal member. Um, I worked for the Kaduk tribe for 20 years as a cultural biologist. I, I, my job was to identify impacts to our culture. Um, currently, I'm a key participant in the ceremonial, uh, the world renewal ceremonies at Enam, Kaduk world renewal ceremony, and um, very honored to be here. Some of the, the knowledge that I used um, growing up in our ceremonies I was able to translate that into different projects or different jobs as a cultural biologist for the Kaduk tribe. I was a Kaduk uh, tribal representative on the Fish and Water, uh, Intertribal Fish and Water Commission. I also participated in the FERC hydroelectric relicing process. And um, now I'm working on prescribed fire and cultural fire. So those are the things that I've been able to utilize um, the spirit of the river to you know, um, to identify uh, goals and objectives and responsibilities of indigenous people here on the Klamath River. Um, Place-based management is key to success on the river. And I believe that the world renewal ideology of all the different indigenous nations along this river provide a great opportunity to, you know, work together on the management in the future. Yo, Thank you. I also think that my dad takes a lot of pride in being a father, grandfather, uncle, and friend. So I think that is very much a part of his personal biography. Um, but I also want to let others, and I will pass it over to Ali Majors Knight of the Machuta people. You are also muted. <laughs> Aha, I pushed the wrong button. Um, uh, hey, Tonani, my name is Ali Metters Knight. I am currently in Machupta territory, also known as Chico, California. Um, I am a traditional practitioner, uh, TEK practitioner. Um, 
what that means, I've, I've been basket weaving and tending land in our traditional territory for over 20 years and working mostly on outdoor education curriculums for children, uh, for education, for elementary, middle school, and high school, as well as the executive director of California Open Lands uh, and a basket weaver, mother of five, and grandma. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, welcome. Um, and then I also would like to introduce or have Keith introduce himself, Keith Parker of the Yurok tribe. Unmute myself. Just want to do, uh, first of all, say thank you for having me here uh, and making me a part of this project. This has turned out to be a pretty awesome thing thus far. Um, so my name is Keith Parker and uh, I am a Yurok tribal member, but my heritage is Yurok, Hupa, Karu, and Tolawa. Um, I'm a senior fisheries biologist for my tribe, for the Yurok tribe. Um, and in my job capacity, uh, I supervise the harvest management division. So I'm responsible for the stewardship of the lower 44 miles of the Klamath River, which encompasses the Yurok reservation from uh, the confluence of the Trinity River at which Peck, well, really a mile above that to uh, where it meets the, the Pacific Ocean and one mile out into the ocean. Um, and so it, we have a very robust uh, fishery um, and we're probably the largest fishing tribe uh, in California. Uh, our, the Yurok and Hupa tribes are the only tribes that have uh, fishing rights recognized by the state of California. Um, for gill netting um, and tribal trust fish species. Um, <clears throat> I also would say that we probably have one of the largest, um, not only effort of our fishery, but the monitoring. Um, so during the peak of the season, we monitor five days a week from like 7 a.m. till 1 a.m. the next day. We just don't run crews for like six hours in the middle of the night because oftentimes just because it's dangerous. Um, <clears throat> so there I just toot the horn for uh, the Yurok tribe fisheries. Uh, my uh, education is from Cal Poly Humboldt locally. Uh, I got my undergraduate and my graduate degree there in specializing in fisheries genetics. Um, some of you may be familiar, I did a lot of work with Pacific lamprey. Uh, we call them eels. Uh, I've been eeling since I was a child. Um, and so it was really cool to be able to work uh, in this venue with these, uh, these traditional foods such as Pacific lamprey that have supported our people since time immemorial during you know, the winter months uh, when salmon were unavailable and me to be able to uh, harvest these fish and then use high throughput genetic analysis to uh, actually discover two new uh, species that we uh, gave Yurok words uh, to, to them to assign them for their distinction. Um, so there's a lot of things we do, um, maybe more in the future, I could talk more about that, but I could fill a lot of time. Um, and just want to say again, thank you for having me. And uh, I think there will be an opportunity later in a panel discussion to talk about uh, some of the paradigms I have regarding DEK. Right on. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I just wanted to highlight that in addition to all the accolades that each of you bring to the table, I feel like you guys are all parents and all people who um, are products of the educational system. So I think it's just a full circle. It's a very, very special time. And with that, I definitely wanted to create more space for um, Florine Super and Maggie Peters who just joined us. I will start with Florine and um, giving herself a, a warm welcome and um, self-introduction. Um, na karuk arara. Um, so my name is Florian and I'm happy to be here. Um, it's, it's an honor to join you guys. <clears throat> I mainly watch you guys on YouTube all the time. And so it just, it's awesome to um, hear your knowledge out there. And it, it's just an honor that you guys are asking me to speak today. So um, just welcome everyone and thank you for having me. And I'll, I'm when I do my presentation, I'll um, do more of my background. But thank you, Yokwa. Thank you, thank you. And I do want to um, pause for a second. There will be two separate panel discussions. So after the curriculum overview, um, we'll have a panel one, which will consist of Ron, Ali, and Keith. 
and then panel two after that. So each of them are 15 minutes. And then after that, we'll do a panel two with Maggie and Florine for like kind of centering more like the parent um, and Maggie being the principal, kind of just having two different um, categories almost. So anyways, with that, um, I would like to pass the mic to Maggie Peters. Hi, greetings, friends. Uh, my name is Maggie Peters. I have been an educator in the Klamath Trinity Joint Unified School District for, this is my 16th year. Um, prior to becoming an educator, I worked for the Kuduk Tribe in Happy Camp, and I was kind of like, my first career was tribal self-governance. And so it's really nice to um, reconnect with folks from uh, the Kuduk Tribe after so many years. Um, and I, I have been working in um, Hoopa Valley as a, primarily a junior high teacher. So it's really special that this a curriculum focuses on junior high education. And um, now that I'm the principal of the Hoopa Valley High School, um, I can definitely see that even though, you know, it might not have the same um, uh, standards, you know, focused, I do think that it would be a very great supplemental curriculum for our teachers here as well. Um, I have prided myself in um, challenging the uh, educational system that emphasizes more of a, you know, white supremacist knowledge base. And, and I think it's very important that Indigenous people, especially in areas where there's a high Indigenous population, such as the reservation or in Humboldt County in general, that it is really the responsibility of all educators in our area to offer Indigenous curriculums, um, traditional uh, knowledge um, that is appropriate for the school setting as frequently as possible. Uh, I suppose that the majority of the things that I've tried to do in my career is integrate art, you know, using Native art as a focus point to um, have broader discussions about what these things mean and, 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 and allow for students to really feel like their knowledge base is valued in the educational system. Uh, especially in junior high, they are really focused on identity and, you know, that um, that affirmation of, of being um, seen and, and showing videos, you know, as, as Florine said, like, you know, showing those YouTube videos to my students and be like, hey, that's my cousin, that's my uncle, you know, that, and this is something, this is a lesson, you know, like, kids are very excited about um, this change in education, and I'm excited to support it. Perfect. Thank you, Maggie. Um, so yeah, I think that we're surprisingly doing really well on time. I'm really impressed and proud of us all for, for maintaining that. I think that's a, kind of a challenge in Indian country. Um, but anyways, I think that um, folks who are just joining us, please feel free to drop any questions for our panelists. And our next se segment is going to be the curriculum overview. So if there's any questions, comments, praise, constructive criticisms it's all encouraged um and at the end of this uh conversation we'll we'll kind of defer to some questions and answers so thank you all for participating and another gentle reminder to make sure cameras and microphones are off if you're not a panelist um and so yeah i think that kind of brings us to our next segment of being in the curriculum overview so i will defer to our it Carrie totally behind the scenes on sharing her screen and so we can kind of give them a glimpse. I will say that it's going to be mind-blowing to see this artwork. It's it's just incredible. Like I was saying earlier, it's something you can't really put words to. You know, you just got to enjoy the, the art. It looks like one sec. Regina. I just have a bunch of stuff open here. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. It looks like Regina had dropped the 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 link to the curriculum, so it's like something you could look on your own terms as well. It's just loading here. And while while we're um about to you know check this out for the first time, I definitely want to give a shout out to our um, graphic designer on this incredible work. It's been really challenging and difficult to get it in in the time constraints that we'd had, but it's all worth it. As you can see here, just a snippet of it. It's just incredible art, incredible design. Um, and that is Keelan Kors, I believe. Sorry if I butchered the name there. But yes, yeah, so check this out. I'll just give you all a moment.
not to disrupt, but I do also want to um, personally shout out uh, Jackie Fawn, who is our featured artist throughout this curriculum. If you follow her, you, you recognize kind of the style, but if you don't, put that on your Instagram, Facebook feed, and you won't regret it. <clears throat> right on. So I think that one of the uh, main objectives of this is just to kind of give folks an idea of what it looks like and just kind of the thought behind how we ordered it and kind of um, structured it. So if we can keep scrolling a little bit to our next uh, stopping point. I really don't want to interrupt in the introduction of this document, but I do want to say that it is so amazing to see a curriculum that is util utilizing um, more of a contemporary base knowledge where uh, as an educator, we want for students to access curriculum. And what I love about this curriculum is that it embeds reading materials, but also videos, you know what I mean? And that those links to those videos are such, such a powerful teaching tool when you're a teacher in the classroom. Um, it's really accessible for um, non-native teachers to feel very comfortable in facilitating this knowledge and kind of getting away from me being the teacher in the room means I have to have all of the knowledge in the room. You know, that it's really important that we open spaces for non-native educators to feel very comfortable in co-learning with their students. So thank you guys so much for making it um, so easy for everyone. Yes, that's exactly what we're gonna highlight is just like the different ways of learning, you know, it steps away from like the traditional teacher student kind of dynamic. It's like, like you were saying, like you can have your uncles, aunties, cousins, friends being the ones who are like educating in classroom and kids are more likely to um, grab onto that and hang on to that rather than like, oh, my teacher's kind of preaching to me again about something they have no idea that I know about. So that's very much like kind of what this includes. And um, I think that's just a brilliant thing that makes, you know, indigenous knowledge in general so special and important is there that connection and relationship that's necessary for, for long-term learning. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this is kind of just like, to, like, so this here is just like breaking down like the objectives and goals. And I think is really awesome to see people in at say California Salmon who have like teaching classroom experience, being able to bring that into this, because for me, I'm like, just let's just give it all up, you know, let's tell them everything we can, but there's so much strategy and like use of these, this content that's very important that like, I wouldn't have really thought about, you know, and as we continue to scroll, we'll see like different like talking points and questions and different things that will help teachers who may be not familiar with indigenous science or knowledge um, get a little bit more comfortable and just kind of like ask the questions so that it's a little bit more engaging if it's something that's maybe not exactly what their comfort zone is. Um, so I think that's just the brilliant part about this all. Um, if we can keep scrolling, maybe we can um, check out the, the kind of like the breakdown of each module. I think that's been requested. So yeah, right here, right here. <clears throat> um, so this is kind of in summary, like this is a six module curriculum. What is TK is like just kind of like the general, like where you're gonna get your your terms kind of that like are throughout the curriculum. Um, just things to think about, like where TK come from. Um, so it's very general, but then it breaks into specific kind of categories like fires, forests, rivers, fish, estuaries, delta, oceans, and and land back. So I think that's just kind of like in a nutshell, what we're, um, what the focus of this curriculum is. And I think we wanted to also talk about, um, like what Maggie was speaking to, the different mediums that we incorporate in each lesson um, with, you know, we have a pre-lab, a lab, and then kind of like projects almost, you know, like where you're able to take what you've learned and put it into your own little project, whether that's a TikTok, a presentation, a paper, whichever like their, you know, their choice of art is, maybe it's even art, you know, so I think that's something that's really incredible. Yeah, we can keep gently scrolling. 
So this is what I was talking about, the teacher narrative. Like, this is something I was like, I'm not a teacher, but I could see how this would be really useful for folks who are just like, I want to be like this ally. I want to be the person who creates space for this, but I don't know how. Um, so I think this is like gives them that like opportunity to see how they can have these harder conversations or different conversations. So I think that's something that some of our contributors were just like, no, we need to have this. I'm like, yeah, I think uh -huh. so. <laughs> um so here's the core concepts. Yeah, Maggie, join, please. I would I would like to add that, you know, in the same sense what Maggie was offering earlier, that I really appreciate the fact that coming from what I call the spirit of the river, you know, you look at the definitions of indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge, it takes the spirit of the people that have lived on the river over time to transfer that knowledge back to the next generation. And when I was growing up, you know, it wasn't so cool to be native. You know, when I started doing work in the late night, in the late, late or the mid 1990s, indigenous knowledge wasn't even identified. It was still anecdotal information. So we created or we gained so much ground when I was going to community college Siskiyou, in the College of the Siskiyous Indian mythology class, I walked in and the in the con the the talk of the day was, or the debate the the debate of the day was the only good Indian is a dead Indian, and so that's what I was going through in my lifetime, and now my children are learning the thing that indigenous scholars. And indigenous people from the river are teaching and we're gaining tremendous ground. So this is this is the accumulation of our, all the hard work, but it's amazing to see it on paper. It's amazing to see it being taught in schools. And it's amazing to be able to empower our children. Not only we send them to school, but when they come back home. You know, Charlie, that we've worked, we've had this relationship that kind of goes from the spirit of the river back to academia. And I think that's the beauty of everybody that is here today can contribute to the future. Thank you for that. I think that um, Maggie had their hand raised as well. So I'm definitely feeling like this could be an opportunity to kind of spitball back and forth. I, pre I appreciate that. I, I do feel like I had some internet um, blockage for a second, but I'm all clear now. Uh, I just wanted to also um, say how, how beautifully put together this document is um, with regard to 21st century classrooms, right? It, it is, it, it's difficult these days as an educator to have like only paper and pencil curriculum, you know, and to really be, um, have that mindset of, of, of integrating TikToks, of integrating slideshows and integrating um, opportunities for students to express their knowledge in multiple ways. The word for that in education right now is it's universally designed. And to have universal design for learning is, is, is imperative to stay um, contemporary with, with the needs of students and teachers these days. You know, when I started teaching 15 years ago, the student brain was much different. The student brain was able to handle longer lectures. The student brain was able to um, uh, uh, interact with one another in, in a way that now, you know, students will sit in the same classroom and instead of having a verbal conversation, they will text each other. You know what I mean? So, you know, the the what's really nice about this is that it kind of affirms who they are by integrating those things. Like they're very technology driven, and um, and it also supports, um, you know, that kind of like we don't have to have waste. This is something that students can be shared in their Google classrooms, you know, and it almost has to be right so that they can access those links. So thanks again for really having um, that technology component embedded into this curriculum. Absolutely. So yeah, we're kind of just cruising through, you know, just having a nice, you know, casual scroll. So that way you can kind of get a feel for it. And um, also just, you know, encouraging folks on the panel to like chime in, because I think that that's why we have you here is to kind of offer those insights. And at first I was like, oh, let's just get through this. But I feel like there's a lot more coming from it, like coming from 
your brilliant minds rather than me just like trying to keep up, you know? So if there's anything that others want to um, contribute to you, I think that's perfect. It looks like Regina has her hand raised. So I'm trying to raise my hand. I'm sorry. I'm, I can't find it on here. Oh, no, you're good. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'm like, I can't say that I can't raise my hand. Uh, um, you know, uh, 2009, um, I went to a program called California Indian Manpower Consortium. And in 2009, uh, I was working on a business plan for workforce development using TEK. But at the time, TEK was not used as a reference or even it wasn't referred to. So I really had to do a lot of research. And back, if we don't remember, 2009 was not a big Google year. Um, back then, you can't really look through the your tippy-typey, you know, research all by yourself on your laptop and come up with gobs and gobs of information. You, re I really had to go seek it in other places and through... Um, and, and, and a lot of times through agents that were just traditional knowledge practitioners that had gone around the country and talked about what they've done. And so the one specific place that I found the term traditional ecological knowledge in 2009 was at Haskell University. And Haskell University was holding a curriculum and teaching TEK at a native college then, but they had almost, I think, shut the program down in 2007. But if anyone's ever worked on a business plan, and worked on vision, um, you know, vision statement or all that stuff. There are things where you have to break down what you're doing into as many less words as possible. And so what I really found was this very three words that kind of hit the spot to explain what the workforce development was about, traditional ecological knowledge. And I remember holding a TEK, kind of work or, you know, uh, education seminar at university with this way to sustainability at Chico State. And um, I had uh, Don Hankins, who was Miwok, who was also a university there doing fire practitioner. And it was um, very unusual to hear the term TEK at that time, even though it was kind of used along practitioners who were trying to explain uh, what they were doing to universities or academia. So it was really good to see this trickle down from a college level into a junior high level and understand that the competency of understanding your environment to be to be truly adapted to your place has to be woven into that TEK, that traditional ecological knowledge, how to be there. And so um, it seemed like that it's not just belongs in academia, it belongs in our lives, it belongs in our schools, it belongs in our homes. And, um, and so it's a really great decolonization tool is, is, is teaching TK. Absolutely. I do see Regina having her hand up. So I, I did want to check in to see if there's anything she want to contribute before moving on to more panel discussion. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say one of the things got that got added into the curriculum um, that I think is really great is um, going into the um, different species for the different ecosystems and then talking about um, how those species are cared for in different ways by the subject matter. So like when we, um, in the fire module, which we're in now, um, in the species part, um, they go into basket weaving materials. And so people get to learn about fire, but then they also get to learn about the benefits of fire besides just um, Besides just, oh, well, having um, cultural and prescribed fire helps save my house, but also it helps with acorns, it helps with basket weaving materials, and then it has activities for the students so that they can connect to those species. Um, and I think that's just something really cool to add into a classroom experience to have the, um, to go further into the um, species in the rivers and then activities so that the students can really get to know those species. Um, anyway, so that's just one of the things I like about the curriculum that I wanted to add, and we can go on to the panel. I'm fine with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for contributing to the conversation. I think that is like one of the unique things that comes with, you know, this content is just like going more in depth on why it's important to have fire on the landscape rather than like, because it's going to save my house. It's like, there's so much more meaning and depth to it than that. And our kids are the you know, they're the future. So them being aware of that at earlier age, the just the better off we'll be. 
Um, so I don't, I think that we're, I'm not sure I want to check in with folks. We can want to continue to looking at the curriculum or do we want to kind of see each other's faces and like kind of have more of a conversation about it? Because that's what we have, but I'm definitely open to being flexible. Yeah, I wanted to add a little bit. Uh, uh, Keystone species are is such a great opportunity to also decolonize our language because a lot of our tribal language is based on our environment, what's on the outside. You really don't see that inside in your classrooms and your like well, you know, inside indoors, you know, it's an outdoor language um, for a lot of us. And so um, being able to talk about keystone species and their ecological zones, like going into a riparia and saying, okay, these are these keystone, like you're going to see this fern, you're going to see, you know, this alder, you're going to see uh, this type of tree and the outside of that pepperwood, you know, but, then when you're really talking, I can tell people, this is Chokawi, this is Tony, this is Lily, this is, these are the names. And it actually becomes like characters. You can easily talk about the characteristics of the plant based on a lot of the language that we use and how that, that comes, why we use that language to say that, that, why that plant is that thing at Keystone Species. What it does is a lot inside of its language and its symbiotic or dancing relationship or sister brother relationship with other plants. Perfect. I do think that um, it seems like we're already gravitating. So I'm just like trying to tap in. I wanted to kind of ask Florine this question of like, so what does this mean as, as a parent, but also as like a leader in the educational system in a county such as Siskiyou? I just wanted to kind of check in to see like what kind of significance this is for you in your personal life, but also in your professional career. Yeah, this is... Um... Awesome. For one thing, I feel like our schools are open to it now. And so it's like the perfect timing for us to really get our curriculum into the school systems. Um, the one thing I do worry about, and um, when Ron was in Wairika, we kind of talked about it. And um, probably a lot of people who live in Wairika have the same feeling. And it's when we have to talk about um, the dams. It's such a hot topic out here, and it's um, sadly um, puts us in a dangerous, could put us in a dangerous situation. So it's not, um, we're not able to talk about it so freely. But, um, but at the same time, I think if we go through the curriculum and you're teaching them and they're learning why we think the way we think, then I think that's going to help that. And so I'm really excited to get this curriculum out to the teachers. Um, like I said, they're just craving for the knowledge and they're, but at the same time, they wanna make sure they're teaching um, the students what we would like them to teach the students. So um, hopefully they can have a contact person. They do reach out to me, but um, sometimes it's hard to get back to all the teachers. So if we could set up like, um, some contact people where they can call and say, hey, if I play this type of music, is that okay? If I show this video, is that really showing what your tribe does? Um, that would be really nice to have that um, set up for the teachers out there. Totally. I can understand like how that would be important. I mean, it's good that they have that filter, but I understand it could be like a barrier to like getting into it. It's just like, I don't want to present misinformation and things. Um, and I think that folks are dropping in information about teacher trainings. And I just had met with a teacher here at a local school and it was just like, you know, just learning the ins and outs, like try not to schedule on a Monday or Friday, like you can, but you might not get the most participation. Friday, you might have like half-minded folks, you know, so like Wednesday might be good, um, stuff like that. So that's something that we are trying to um, remember and like also support. Um, it sounds like we kind of almost need like an indigenous hotline, you know, like, is this cultural appropriation or is this like accurate representation that that's probably uh, a project for a different time, but that's, that's something that kind of funny popped in my head. Um, I have like, so since we're kind of like on the topic of Siskiyou County and just like how sensitive certain content is and things like, you know, dam removal or just like, it's just very bureaucratic and like political out there, I feel like. Um, so I just wanted to kind of check back in with my dad to see how 
see what this means to him and just like what it means for the future generations in Siskiyou County um, to have this representation in, in our curriculum. Um, yeah, thank you. Like, like I tried to articulate earlier, it's very important to see this going through the school system. I mean, I think I've been trying to integrate traditional knowledge for a very long time now with very little impact. But now all the different things we've been working on over time has now resonated, resonated into um, work plan. You know, so I feel very comfortable looking at things that are on those work plans that I can contribute to as a community member, utilizing the knowledge that was put down by the great creator throughout our ceremonies, our world renewal ceremonies. is based on family, the health and wellness and the balance and harmony of our family. And how do we do that now? Erasure has an erasure of colonialism has created a vacant area in our mental landscape. So all the different things that our elders teach us doesn't really totally connect to the world that we're being led into. So now with academia stepping in and showing that this is the true um the true path to health and wellness, you know, by the people that are need that health and wellness. So, you know, being able to work with Wairika and Florian over the years, we are just now, we're just now being able to have that conversation about what are the impacts to the tribal community in Wairika because of that beat down, that beat down mentality. So we're going out and taking some stamina out soon to kind of go out and try to revive the spirit of our people. So how do you talk about the importance of salmon when you don't, when it's not on your table? It's not part of your, your thought process, you know? And, and then when you're sitting there thinking about the impacts of not having salmon on your table, even when the damp, even in the good times, you don't have salmon on your table. So that's kind of like just the, um, being able to connect people through knowledge. And probably the most important thing right now, and I'll leave, leave us with, is the fusion of indigenous knowledge and Western science that will get us to a level of management we need for the future. Perfect. Thank you for adding that very important perspective. Um, I do want to um, kind of pivot and ask Keith as he's a parent he has young he has some children so like kind of also like asking the question of like how important is this to you as a parent but also as like as a um, senior fishery technician like I feel like you kind of walk this world and so what does this mean for your family and your kids to have to grow up in a world where this is represented in curriculum and what does it mean like how do you see this being um influence in in the workspace well you know i'm extremely excited by this curriculum and you know throughout my life as well uh like like ron you know i've feel like i've been an ambassador or a translator oftentimes trying to bridge the gaps between western science western establishment and traditional knowledge you know from growing up on the river um and so, you know, as I've often talked about before in my presentations is that this isn't just science for me, right? Like I push back against this false narrative that social justice doesn't intersect science because it does. So for like Klamath River Basin people, right? When every time we, we lose more salmon or we lose more sturgeon or we lose another species, it isn't just a loss of biodiversity from a scientific perspective. From a TEK perspective, it's a loss of our piece of our cultural heritage that's gone, that will that can never come back, right? It isn't going to come back. Like for instance, Yulikon. When I was a child, I used to go to the mouth of the river. My I'm a Safford and a Van Pelt, Safford Island. My grandfather would take me down and we would catch Yulikon and smoke them, right? And hooligans, right? In Alaska, you call them, right? And they're gone now, right? They're completely wiped out. A lot of the things like that are, are wiped out or greatly reduced, right? And, and this is our, our traditional foods, right? Um, because you know, at the core of our tribal sovereignty is our food sovereignty. Food is a foundational part of, of our people and all of this stuff evolves synchronously, not independently. Our art, our language, 
our food, our culture, our ceremony. We even have ceremonies about food, like the first salmon ceremony, right? At, at the mouth of the river when the, the runners would be sent up every spring and the first spring salmon would come in, right? But now we've wiped out 98% of the spring salmon. Only 26, 26 adult spring Chinook returned last year to the South Fork Trinity. Only 95 returned to the Shasta, right? I mean, this is where we're at, right? And I, I envision this as a way to help us take back, right? Because it's our birthright to practice science and practice traditional knowledge on our Aboriginal territory. It's our birthright because we were the first scientists here. We were the scientists that were here before the last ice age, tens of thousands of years before um, Europeans you know, came here and, and other settlers, right? Um, so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that carry through for my children too. Um, but I think also, I gotta say, um, I'm also equally excited about this curriculum for a lot of the native students, because there, is a, there are a lot of native students that do not live locally or do not live on the reservations, right? They live in outlying areas and they have some contact with tribal families and some fishing and hunting, but it's limited, right? It might be a weekend here, a weekend there. So I'm excited too about help using this as a tool to help educate our tribal children as well that don't, don't live here locally and, and are spread all over. Um, like, I'm gonna put my three children through this whole curriculum, just do it on our own, right? Because there's all kinds of really awesome things in there that things that even I can learn um, about condors or things that aren't in my field, right? Or, or traditional practices. Um, so I don't know, I think I'm just rambling now, but yeah, I, th th this, this piece that when I went through it the other day after you guys emailed it out, I was just blown away by the combination of like art and traditional knowledge and science and that intermixing. Cause you know, I mean, I know some of you can relate to this, you know, in my job as a tribal scientist every day, like I've talked about in some of my presentations, if you took like three circles, like TEK and my place-based identity and my Western science training and where those three circles overlap that little space, that's where I live every day as a tribal scientist. And much of my job is just translating from my tribal council to PFMC or Bureau of Reclamation or US Fish and Wildlife, and then translating back, you know, and wearing these multiple hats of being able to speak Western science language and be able to speak traditional language, right? You know, um, uh, as an analogy. Um, so, um, you know, I think this uh, TEK curriculum also is going to be really instrumental in helping um, knocking down a lot of the barriers, as Ron alluded to earlier. And I have to agree, I, I often say, for lack of a better word, that TEK is like the new, you know, trendy, it's the new sexy, you know, abbreviation, right? Like it's being thrown around all over. Uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is the appropriation of it. I've already seen it start to happen. People are already starting to appropriate this whole TEK thing on their own and universities and stuff. And so I'm glad that, you know, curriculum like this is going out to help, you know, maybe combat that a little bit. Um, because I often hear the same thing that Ron has talked about. You know, I, I, I'm not a, you know, uh, a young person anymore. So I'm in my 50s. And I was told for many years that it's anecdotal. It's mythology, right? It doesn't carry the same weight as peer reviewed science, right? Because it's passed down orally from generation to generation. And that's, that's a bunch of BS, right? We all know that. Actually, it's much more complicated to be able to pass down knowledge through oral traditions, through thousands of generations than it is through written, so. Thank and I you. wanted to just touch one more thing and then I'll shut up. Earlier, you, guys, you were talking about fire management and fire culture and, and you know, there's this mentality, I, I deal with it all the time. And I'm so glad that, that this whole cultural burning um, education is just coming out. And there's a lot of papers coming out. It's part of this curriculum because you know um, the Western attitude is, is like fire's bad, right? Fire's bad, right? And as native people, right? We don't, the four elements of the earth, right? Uh, we don't put 
human traits on that. We don't say it's good, it's bad. The creator gave us fire for a reason. But I can tell you as a fisheries biologist that the salmon on the Klamath River Basin co-evolved with fire. Absolutely. So when these fires are raging upriver, which is awful, you know, or other places, that smoke cover, it's been lowering the river on an average of six to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. I can even show you the pulse runs of fish that occur that enter the estuary and start running shortly after the smoke cover occurs. So, you know, um, these fish co-evolved with fire over millions of years in this basin. And so these are the kind of things that we just need to like tease out um, about, you know, these judgments that are placed on things like fire. So. Perfect. That's great information you just shared with us. And I think something that, that you said that stood out to me that like a perfect kind of transition to like a next question I want to pose to each of our panelists is how do we think that teaching this TEK curriculum will change how policy decisions are made in California? Because it seems like current policymakers don't have very much knowledge. So like how does this contribute to policy decisions? And I will um, start with Ali. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've got to be like hands on with a lot of policy making uh, or changing through TEK. Um, it starts, it does, start, it did start on a federal level, speaking with forestry, speaking with agents, uh, federal agents, uh, working within, not only also within my tribal government. So you see my, as a TEK practitioner, that does not make me the EPA coordinator. See, that's a whole different agency. That's a whole different arm of the Secretary of Interior application to land and trust and how the federal government manages tribal lands that are within tribal territory. So there's a different language. So first it's understanding the policy and who you're talking to. So tribal territory that's not uh, land and trust is still within the procurement of tribal lands to take care of. It's still within our territory. Now, um, so I was able to go to forestry and go into a lot of uh, programs that basically, for the best word, were in a crisis. Not only in a crisis because they didn't have, they didn't all have a, a, a whole like a holistic approach to how to take care of land. So, for instance, a lot of times when I'm working with uh, cons uh, conservation and easements and mitigation areas, they're single seat species savior complex, I call it, the single species savior complex, where they're going to save just an owl or just one lizard or one thing, when TEK really educates the policymaker about the ecosystem and the entirety of a healthy ecosystem and how that supports just one species, but it supports its, its whole neighborhood. And so it also becomes to where I've also seen it affect. So all this talking in forestry, I was able to go and speak to, to a subcommittee in Congress. I'm able to talk as a traditional practitioner, not as an agent within my tribal government or even a lot tribal leader elected, but actually as a real practitioner and saying, no, I really do basket weed gathering for a long time. I really know I have really done restoration in different techniques outside of the scope of a colonial mindset. So I can actually speak to this. And so it was able to have a, the federal, you know, a Biden issue a an order all the way down into forestry that I want to see what they called ITEK, Indigenous Traditional Ecological Knowledge. He said, I want to move. I want to see you all put it in your report. That push allowed me to make and work with my tribe to, to work on the very first self-determination seed banking 638 contract in the United States and the nation. And so that was based on TEK knowledge, informing the legislation and policymakers, having them just trickle down and say, okay, we got money for it. We're going to spend it down. But you really have to understand also just how the complexity of how this money comes through and trickles through to federal governments into tribal agencies, but also tribal nonprofits and, 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 and school districts and whatnot through 30 by 30 we've really been able to tap into the policies and spend money down on conservation because they want to see uh, impacts that directly affect people that are at risk the most for climate change. And that happens to be a lot of tribal communities. So we're able to actually work the system against itself in a certain way at this point, only because it's in a crisis. 
And either we're going to take advantage of the crisis or somebody else is. So I think that we're the better guys, we're the lesser evil, and by far, as far as coming in and talking and saying, look, open your mind. So one of the biggest uh, policies we're able to push right now, and I'll be working, is the implementation of federal forests being managed and stewarded by tribes and saying all tribes should get at least 10 acres. If you want more, take it. But let's give you some funding and so the ability to do workforce, because here in California, 33 million acres of federal forest, right? And we have they're looking at the crisis of, of, of managing all these forests without a lot of funding through the state. And so we're stepping in and saying, okay, tribes can have a chunk of this, you can have a chunk. And this is really, um, I guess I'm just speaking to how TEK can actually talk to policy, change policy, but it's a an actual thing. It's not a future thing. It's actually happening right now. Thank you. Wow, that's a great response. Um, I will ask Maggie how this um, kind of how she imagines this like influencing the California policies policies from her standpoint, being the um, principal at Hoopa High. Well, there's so many things that I want to share right now, and some of it was inspired by um, by Ron when I was uh, working for the Kaduk Tribe several years ago. I remember. Being on a team with Leaf and um, and we went and we were trying to get federal recognition of the Kaduk fishery, and at the time, you know, it was really difficult because there was a lot of people who didn't understand policy wise that federal recognition of a fishery doesn't imply that there will be water rights, and so there was a lot of um, you know obstacles, primarily from um, people that had a vested interest in water rights and the upper Klamath. And, and so we we were, you know, even though we were able to get um, Congressman Wally Herger at the time to help sponsor a bill, um, it was really having a hard time getting any traction because there were so many people in his particular district that were against it. And even tribes at the time were against it because where would this allocation of fish come from? And it was incredibly frustrating and also, um, um, but also just such a passion project, right? So, you know, when you look at education and you look at this ability to inspire passion at such a young age, that these are the kids who will realize, you know, that this, that this matters. And, and I know that what, what, um, was just shared with Ali was that this is influencing policy right now, but imagine the policy change and the shifts that can happen when we empower our young people, you know? And so, and, and at the time when we were, you know, back East, I was in my early twenties. And so, you know, I felt like at the time, like I was a young person. And another thing that was very ironic is that we would leave the office of the special, um, where were we at? Um, the office of the special trustee, right? This is the office of the people who are supposed to advocate, you know, um, at, at a at a at an administrative level for native tribes, and and we kind of felt like we were getting doors closed and you know a lot of like not real commitments, and we would walk out of that um, office and and there in a, a beautiful color photo was an image of the Kaduk tribal fishery, in the hallway of the office of special trustee who just kind of told us in a nice way that it was really going to be a very difficult task for them to support us in an administrative a recognition of the cut of tribal fishery. So, you know, I'm thinking kind of the same thing, you know, let, let's empower our youth. Let's, let's, let's embrace these, you know, opportunities for, for them to see, you know, if I can come to school, this matters, right? You know, one thing that we aren't really acknowledging in the school system is that we are elevating a knowledge base, you know, again, from a, a culture that is not of our own. And, and there is a message there that the tribal, the traditional culture, the culture based knowledge is not as important because it's not elevated in the school system. And, um, and so to me, it's like, you know, we can surface such great strength in our youth when we empower them with their own knowledge and we focus it and we center it in the schools where now this, it matters, you know? And, and so I see a, a tremendous amount of change within, you know, especially the next generation 
where we are empowering youth to, to infiltrate these organizations, right? To become policymakers, to become people that work within powerful organizations that are causing impacts, you know, to, to, to traditional ecological knowledge. You know, that they could be members of the Forest Service, the parks, you know, they could be members of PG&E, right? They can be with, and they can, they can affect change within. And so that's what I'm really excited about. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because that's something that I was thinking when we're talking about like how this influence policy decisions. It's like, for one, it's like we're starting to invest that possibility into our youth by like giving them the skills and giving them the knowledge that then they can take that and run with it you know so we're just planting a bunch of seeds into their minds and I think that that's such a great investment um I do want to um give others a chance to speak to this and I will go with uh Florine I would like to know um how you imagine um this effort influencing how possibly influencing um policy state policy um, so I was just sitting here thinking, well, um, like I said, I'm honored to be here with you guys because I feel like I'm just doing my little part over here and teaching language, you know, um, here at the Wairika High School, but it kind of expanded from that. I, I've been teaching for probably, probably the last 18 years, and um, I recently have been seated on the school board and then um, um, selected within our board to be the chair of the school board. So I'm really happy about that because I don't think there has been a Native American on our local um, Jackson Street Evergreen School Board. And so um, to me, that's like a step in the right direction. Um, I don't plan on going into any um, city or supervisor position, but I feel like just being a Native person in a on a board that has never had a Native American in there that our students now can vision themselves in those leadership roles. So I'm really excited about that. So that's one thing I wanted to say. And then, um, and just being able to share our culture within our school systems. Um, I taught to some students in the Bay Area over Zoom and probably 80% of the students felt like the tribes were non-existent. They thought they were just kind of in the history books and there, there was no tribes. Um, so I feel like just being out there educating our students to bring them aware of who we are. And I feel like when I started working in the schools, my main thing was to create a safe place so that we could speak our language and so that's just kind of like one step. And I feel like with the curriculum, that's just gonna like support that. And it's just, you know, gonna really take off. Um, and so over here in Siskiyou County, I'm in the elementary schools, the high schools, and just started um, working on COS campus. So um, I'm really excited about that, but I do need support. So I'm glad like, um, I have you guys here to kind of say help over this way, but <laughs> but just wanted to let you guys know. So I think um, that is going to help us with um, changing people's mind and policies that come up. Perfect, great. It sounds like you're doing some really great work, and the uh, you know the the community seems like that they're open for it, which I feel like is such a big pivot point and big opportunity to head in the right direction. Um, so I think that that's just so, super important work. Um, so that I will ask my dad now what he thinks as far as um, how we imagine this effort being like how it influences state policy from his perspective. You know, um, you know, thank you so much, Maggie. You kind of open up old wounds and you heal them all in the same sentence. So that's always, always really good. And also to articulate to the fact that there was a life before our children. There is so much work, the foundational work that a lot of us do before children get here. And it's almost like a, a, a magic wand comes over you because once you have your children, for me, it was all the different teachings that I received from my mother and my elders came to, came to be. So it's, it's all about, okay, maybe you're in survival mode, but now you change and you're doing the best you can for your children. So that allows 
for this movement to be here, to be actually happening today. So I'm gonna thank you for that articulation. And um, thank you also, Florine, for all the hard work you're doing out there. I worked out there on the hydroelectric licensing and on the Clown River Task Force for many years out in Wairika, but didn't was not ever impacted like I was the other day. The impact that I, I heard from the community allows me to be more compassionate and to be more involved in what you're trying to accomplish out there because so many of our people were forcibly removed to these locations and a lot of their medicines are still with them with no outlets. So those are very important messages I got from them folks. So it's so important to kind of go back out and lead with our resources, lead with our management, lead with our true lifestyle to be able to get into the impacts of whatever we're looking at. So that's kind of like the outlier here. And I think everything we're talking about right now is, has to do with fire. Fire is the giver and taker of life. Fire is its own entity. Every aspect of our, the human lifestyle needs fire from prayer to warmth to food. Fire is everything. The human rights issue with colonialism is called cultural genocide. That's a taboo word, but that's exactly what we're resisting. The resilience that this community provides today is that sense of resilience. Fire was used as a primary force management tool that was also our best teacher. All our ethno sciences, all the hunters, fishermen, the gatherers, they were connected to fire because we had a inherent responsibility to go manage the resource with fire before we had a right to harvest, to procure, and to be able to provide to our communities as well as a ceremony. The giver and taker of life um, is so important because it teaches our children the important aspects of that intergenerational transfer of knowledge, the things that make me healthy at night is what I've been able to do for my children. If that was severed, there's a piece of you that is unhealthy because your children are unhealthy. So those are the things that are very, you know, so important, you know, uh, that we're talking about today. And, you know, what it really means to the future is that our women and our youth in this patriarch society is underutilized, if utilized at all. We have to integrate the matriarchal society the way the great creator provided. I'm only a role player for that society, and yet I'm still trying to figure out what that role really is. But with fire providing that foundation of knowledge that remains the same over space and time allows us to be who we truly are. Because of the demonization of the colonial society to our indigenous culture has created this dramatic impact to the health and wellness of our communities. This work that's going on right now allows us to transfer the knowledge successfully to the next generation. Because now we can look back at Western science on what we're doing with fire, what we, our knowledge of fish and all the other resources that we call our relations because of that relationship we build with fire. So getting fire back in the landscape is so important. When I was on the Klamath River Fisheries Task Force back in the 1990s, I told the task force that when the dams come out, we're gonna need fire to be able to recreate the transfer reach out to the Pacific Ocean. The most prolific spawning and rearing habitat in North America is in the upper basin with the volcanic water system up there. So all these different things are interconnected and the dams have severed that. The demonization of our ceremonies, our, uh, the use of fire has created this colonial existence of the tribes of, you know, in this basin. With this knowledge that is being derived from all the different sovereign nations is providing leadership into the future. You know, so 
A lot of the different things that I have done with my children are being practiced in this new level of education that we're promoting today. I didn't teach my children the Kaduk language as their first uh, the Kaduk language as their first language, but I taught the Kaduk lifestyle as their first lifestyle. And the value of knowledge going through our lives has created the sense of healthiness that is also looking into the future. So all the different ethnosciences we depend on for our lifestyle starts with fire, starts with our ceremonies, Creation stories are our guideposts. And these are the things that we're gonna be able to drive out of the information coming in from cultural practitioners, from academia, and believe it or not, the policy makers are gonna be guiding the way on this new lifestyle benefits to indigenous people. So it's huge. There's, you know, um, very honored to be here, but this is truly needed for a long time. and. The future is now ours. The future is something now to build on. This is junior high. What about all the way down to the baby basket? And then after that, the elders. The elders as being these teachers have to be reincorporated with the people in the baskets. That's the lifestyle, the missing component of our lifestyle today and all the different pieces of what we're all working on We'll be able to revitalize the culture so we can stare directly in the future and be comfortable providing a pathway for our children. Not anecdotally, but by indigenous knowledge and Western science to create that health, that healthy pathway. Thank you for that, Dad. I do want to respect everyone's time as we approach a little after seven. Um, and also, uh, I, it just flew by so quickly, you know, just great conversations. Um, so I think we will start channeling our time more towards like closing remarks. So if anyone has any like last minute thoughts and also, um, so yeah, last minute thoughts. And there are a couple questions in the chat, but we'll, we'll see if we have a little bit of extra time to, to speak to those. But, um, yeah, so I would like Keith, if he has any last minute re uh, remarks, um, please. Just put me on the spot, man. Uh, That's my job. Yeah, just uh, briefly, <laughs> I guess, uh, I just wanted to comment that one of my mentors who was instrumental in me being the scientist and, and actually a lot about the person that I am and my development was uh, Dr. Jacqueline Bowman from Humboldt State University. And uh, Jacqueline used to tell me, you want to make change, infiltrate, get your education, infiltrate the establishment and do it from within. And then she looked at me and said, even water can split rock when it freezes, you know, be the water, right? Get into these federal agencies, be that water that freezes and can even and just split the rock. And so that always just sticks with me. And so, um, as some of you know, I'm a Robert Patricia uh, Switzer fellow and a lifelong fellowship that I got when I was in graduate school. And one of the fellowship uh, privileges was, is I was able to be flown out and met with Kamala Harris before she became vice president and sat in her office and had a half hour conversation back in like 2017 or 18 about dam removal on the Klamath River and about traditional knowledge and Keystone cultural and keystone biological species and all of this stuff that we're talking about tonight. Um, and so I just want to enter on a really positive note. You know, we've come a long way. She's now the vice president. We have, you know, a person of color, a woman, as the vice president of this country, the new Department of Interior director, a woman, indigenous woman, right? Change is happening so rapidly. The dams, as we know, <laughs> you know, everyone's having parties, right? Like, the final hurdle, dams are coming down, condors are reintroduced to the basin. I mean, and the list goes on. So for all the things that you see in the news, like, oh, there's going to be thousands of species that are going to die between, and it's true, there's some bad news, but there's so much great news too. 
And I just really want to like focus on that and bring that to my children and going forward and use that, you know, to enable a lot of this curriculum because that's, that's just what it's going to take. It's going to take a lot of hard work of combining our different forces. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, so I'm leaving this meeting and, and, and just kind of leaving the day when I go out and eat my dinner here in a few minutes and just try to leave my every day. I try to leave on a positive note, even if I've had a bad day, because there's just amazing things happening. And just look at all the, what are there's 30 some, we started off at 40 participants. Just think of all the collective work that all of us are doing right now and how all of us are, have all these different forces that are coming together. Right. And it's just, it's very powerful. This movement is very powerful and I'm really excited about it. And just think what's going to happen post dam removal. Think of the incredible changes that are going to happen to the Klamath River Basin in many different ways. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Keith. Thank you very much for that um, very inspiring closing segment. I will ask Ali to um, maybe give up some final thoughts as well. Yeah, I'll be brief. I know everyone's hungry. It's getting late. So I just, you know, I was listening to everyone talk and I remember I found a picture of my great grandfather, Carl Delgado, not too long ago. And he's up in Karuk, or in Yurok country, in Karuk country, working on a program was called NICE or N I C E. Um, I believe it was back in the 50s and 60s, uh, maybe 70s. And it was collectively taking um, all these Native folks and, and their educators. And I'm like, that was my great grandfather. And now it's 2022. And like that legacy is passed on as an educator. I'm an educator. He was a principal at uh, Round Valley Indian School. And then he spent his whole life as, a, as an educator and he was known as coach in Lake County and they have a little gymnasium named after him at the high school. And so it's like, it's the native educators. And my, it's, 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 it's in our history, but it's also as wonderful as that we're all working together again. And it also reminds me of how long this has taken on. My great grandfather was working in, with Yurox and Karuks years ago to build a curriculum and education for native youth about their culture in the 1970s. This has been going on for quite a while. And I really, um, I just want to acknowledge that this has been ongoing and, and, and our ancestors that are before us that have worked so hard to get to this point too. I, I want to acknowledge them and say thank you and you know, I, I see you and I hope you see me and I hope I'm proud. I make them proud. And um, and I'm so proud about the dams being removed. Man, talk about tenaciousness. I want to cry right now. You know, a shout out to all of y'all. Hoopa, Karuk, and Yurok, all of you. Young, today, everybody, thank you. I really, it's so inspiring because I've seen you fight for that dam removal. Man, if you can do that, that was just amazing. And um, I'm just floored and so excited to be alive right now and witness this power in Indian country kind of swelling up and um, and this curriculum uh, teaching, because I, I just want to say how we've been working on this for so long, all of our families have, and I'm really excited about it. And um, I don't know what else to say other than just, just get involved and do this. And one more thing I'd like to say about TEK is that this is an environmental education so it's really hard to teach this in and and so i and just on video it has to be incorporated with touching and feeling and being in the nature so don't forget about those field trips don't forget about being outside and being in the element because that is a key component to this tek education thank you ali for being vulnerable and sharing authentic feelings you know i think that's something that we're all holding and carrying so appreciate you sharing those with us um, I will um, ask the remaining panelists, the, you know, closing thoughts and questions, but there was a question I think is perfect for Maggie um, from the audience. Um, let me see if I can find it really quick. I thought it was right here, but chat is blowing up, but it was um, someone is curious to hear more about Native STEAM and the relationship between TEK and the contemporary relationship with technology for today's youth. And I think he spoke this a little bit earlier, but just as like a closing thought and maybe a, an answer for that. I'm trying to find it as well. I'm just gonna, so I can really speak to it. Can you tell me who it was? It was, um, am I? 
Yeah, it was Juniper Summers here. I could just, I think it might have been a direct message I just quickly looked at, but here you go. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I, for STEAM, you know, I was a math teacher for a very long time and I really tried to do my best for youth to integrate um, arts and uh, not as much technology, but, you know, like understanding that teaching tools had to have a, a strong technology piece. Um, you know, I too am a basket weaver. I too am a regalia maker. Uh, and I think that our kids really resonate with um, that um that our culture is not a culture without a connection to the land you know what i mean that's so deeply rooted you know that they go to ceremonies they go fishing they go hunting um and i think that the contemporary relationship with technology with students i do think is a little bit divisive from those traditional practices but i also think that if um supported well in in the classroom you know, could be a way for students to really express um, worldwide, you know, really could be expressed like this is who I am. Um, I think that our the identities of our young students um, are so fragile when it comes to technology, you know, that we do need more work in self-expression um, through media, you know, social media bases, through through sharing who they are, um, because they don't see it as much, right? So when they're on their devices and they're looking at social media, you know, they're, they're, I do have a fear that they are, because they're, they're not represented as, as, as frequently, right? That, that AI of those devices is not really um, bringing up more native knowledge things. Um, but if we could create that, you know, an amazing thing that's happening on my campus right now is Annie O'Rourke is asking students to, to make a lot of videos, you know, and the kids, you know, all have their iPads and they're very engaged in making videos. And if, if we connect tech with that, to, you know, that teaching tool, then students can really um, and have enough of those videos that the AI recognizes you know, and they can be published, you know, so that they are getting that affirmation. Um, and, you know, I, I, one of the things that I was really just wanting to share really quickly, and that I think would be good for Florine as well. Um, and I, I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, can you help me share my screen real quick? Is one of the passion projects that I have integrating um, traditional knowledge and technology is really supporting students and creating projects that are like language, oops, I don't know what I just did. Sorry, are really language-based opportunities. And, um, you know, the, this is just a project that I created for um, an example of what is possible. So taking local artistry or student art, right? Students can use their own art and integrate language and you can embed on chat, on chat, on chat. You can embed language pieces through that um, curriculum. And of course, in this kind of art as well, you know, there could be a spin-off of, you know, I see fish, I see acorns. That's where that traditional ecological, ecological uh, um, knowledge can come out as well. And so, um, you know, the, the ability for students, you know, if this was a model for students to create, think about how many different tools we would have for, for, the, for the elementary school, right? If, if high school students were engaged in creating these kind of um, uh, technology-based learning supports, you know, adult people too, but I mean, this could be a project in your classroom, you know, and it can be integrated with video. It can be integrated with lots of things that's, you know, that is really refreshing a part of the, the curriculum that was shared tonight. Um, but it's it's all very exciting, you know, and as, you know, I guess a closing remark would be um, these opportunities for our students are so important. Um, there are so many kids that feel completely lost in school, completely lost. And like school, this isn't a place for me. You know, I don't, you know, why do I have to learn these things? And even if there was just, you know, like if we can create like CTE pathways, right? You know, I would love to be a part of a project where we have a CTE pathway for high school students where they could take two to three years of an elective and have some sort of certification about tech as an outcome, 
right? So, I mean, this is beginning something that can be very large for our students and can be a model program, you know, throughout the United States where, you know, the teachings that, you know, that Ron has, uh, has gained over a lifetime, you know, can be integrated into A through G classwork in high schools, you know, and it can start with this curriculum and elementary skill, start building that passion, you know, and then in their um, elective, their A through G elective CTE credentialed, Ron could be a teacher at our high school right now, based on the amount of, you know, you only need three years, three years in your field, and you can be a CTE educator in, our, in, in the high school right now. And, you know, so I just see so much potential um, for students feeling like our public education system is a place for them. The more we build these kind of curriculum supports. Perfect. That's such a beautifully woven, like answer the question and closing remarks. Thank you. Um, I will ask Florine for some closing remarks as well before heading to my dad and then we'll kind of close her down. Oh my goodness, Maggie, you have my mind going now. That was awesome. I so want to do that. <laughs> um, that is so true about our students not feeling comfortable at school and um, Ron heard from great grandma, great great grandma, I think, um, that she didn't feel comfortable. She still doesn't feel comfortable for her own kids going to school. And so um, I'm really excited for this curriculum to get into the school systems. Um, I like it because I'm not a teacher um, or I'm not, um, I didn't go to school to be a teacher. <laughs> and so having this curriculum and sharing it in my language classes or anytime I do leadership with students, anytime I'm just with our youth, I could just pull out a lesson. Um, I love when it has language in it and we just, um, I used it in an adult language class too. We read stories and um, so I don't have to create anything. I could just grab a chapter, grab a little, you know, just a little part of it and throw it into my curriculum and I think it's awesome and I think that's going to be a good thing for um, our teachers in the school too. Um, I had one student say that um, you know he doesn't go into my classroom but just seeing me in the classroom you know a native person that's in the school it just makes his heart happy and so um, I think just having this and having people be able to relate and can talk and actually verbalize it like hey everybody knows about this now I can talk about it I don't have to like hide over here and talk about it with my family um, I did a presentation to the eighth grade class at Jackson Street and where I was talking about my mom who's a full blood and so she went home to her mom and shared hey I learned all this stuff about the Kedoops and they have like full-blooded tribal members that you know, how come our family's not like that? We're like mix. And so that she was able to bring conversation back to her home. And so, yeah, this just gets me really excited because I think it can just open up doors for everybody, tribal members and non-tribal members. So I'm really looking forward to this curriculum. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Florine. And last but not least, I definitely want to let my dad have some closing remarks before I shut her down. Okay, you know, thanks a lot. Very inspiring here tonight. Listen to everybody. It touches, you know, it touches on a lot of different places in our in our life in our lifestyle. You know, um, one of um, one of the biggest things. There's a lot of different things I've done in my life, probably good and bad. But I think that what has really come to me right now is a sense of uh, I guess the sense of accomplishment to be able to get my kids to go to school, get their degrees. And, and right now, Charlie is, you know, is that person we can look at right now and say that, yeah, uh, we are on the right path, you know, and I have other children with their degrees, you know, fish biologist and, you know, uh, you know, and I have another child working on, on, on fire, 
um, you know, working his ranks up to the Forest Service. You know, my youngest son just graduated from the University of Oregon, and he started a, a national fire collaborative, hashtag fire, fire generation. And um, what does this all mean? It means it's a, it's a lifetime of work that a native per, uh, indigenous person has. He has an inherent responsibility to the landscape in which his people and the people who walk before him and the people who will walk on after him. That's the inherent responsibility. Luckily, I was connected to this ceremony to keep me grounded to the closest thing, to the things I was told were the closest things to truth on earth, the words and the things that you do at the ceremonies. So those are the things that we're trying to reestablish in the communities today. And um, as you know, as I'm lecturing in universities, as I'm inspiring non-native children in these universities, this gives me a great opportunity to come right back into the communities, the riverine communities that are so close and passionate to all of our lifelong endeavors are right here. This gives me the opportunity to provide that inspiration to the river, to the people that have suffered tremendously from modern society. But one of the mo most important things where I'm at today personally is the accumulation of all this information, all the different work I've had, I've been able to meet with a wonderful group called Conservation X Labs. It's a fire, it's a fire organization. And they basically have technology and funding for indigenous led communities into the future. I introduced Ryan to this group, newfound group, and they helped him go to DC with contacts. So these people are very prominent in the industry of fire and they're reaching out to indigenous fire practitioners. So in the next couple months, I'll be out reaching out to people in the fire world, not just along the river, but in our region to reestablish the things that the great creator gave us to be able to sustain life over time. It's all connected to our ceremony. It's all connected to the knowledge based system that we have today. This happens to be not just indigenous, there's Western science that's included now. That's what this group is doing, is creating a space, a bridge to these two intellectual silos to be able to create a future product. So honored to be here today. Um, and so honored to be able to provide leadership into the future tomorrow based on what we did yesterday. So thank you very much for the organization. Thank you so much for the people that are continually have the passion to be able to fight the odds that are never in our favor. With all the hard work, the dedication and sacrifice, much like our world ideology, we keep on grinding, we keep on grinding because we depend on those miracles. Just not right away, but those miracles are coming. And this is one of those miracles right here that is this and Conservation X Labs, to me personally, creates a shining light into the future that not only provides leadership for local people, but like our world ideology, we provide leadership for the rest of the world. Yo, Tom. Thank you. I feel like I've heard versions of that my whole life, but it never ceases to give me the chill. So thank you for sharing that with amazing people, amazing panelists and participants. I just feel the inspiration and um, you know enthusiasm in the chat even. Uh, just very humbling and honoring to be in this time, you know, living in a world where there's so much inspiration, so much hope, um, opportunity for growth. You know, just it just never ceases to amaze me, like all the the beautiful work and the commitment and dedication that folks here today are are dedicated to achieving. So I definitely wanted to acknowledge that. And um, you know, I think we are kind of coming to a close. Like I said I'm pretty proud of us for uh, sticking to time. We're pretty close. I couldn't. I've anticipated this close of a time frame, but um, I do want to kind of do a little closing logistics. Um, 
as we know, we're here for the science and management TEK junior high school curriculum. So folks, looks like Maggie has her hand raised. So I'll go ahead and check in. I don't want to interrupt. I just wanted to say kind of like seeing the two of you just also really inspires a, a comment about when you have a passion, when you can grow up and have an affirmed passion, then your family is stronger and you raise children with passion. You know, and I think that when we when we look at uh, individual people in our communities that have affected change in very positive ways, you know, we can see that that passion, you know, and be it, you know, whether or not they had access to it at school, right? So right now we're talking about giving passion, access to passion at school. But what comes from that isn't just policy change, right? It's strengthening our tribal com communities and even for our non-Native friends that we share spaces with, right? they have a strength in, in their knowledge base and they'll grow an appreciation that can support, you know, native um, knowledge and protect, you know, like, so, you know, if even if non-native students are sharing classrooms with native students and they, they see like, this is inspiring a passion in me, then we're building stronger partnerships for the future as well. But I just wanted to say that, like just seeing the dynamics between Charlie and Ron, you know, really inspired that kind of like reflection point of, you know, thinking about my kids, and, and being somebody who had the ability to be inspired by Ron as a young person too, you know, and building that passion within and within me, I can see it in my kids as well. You know, as Ron said, like having fisheries biologists, having, you know, five, having strong, strong children, I can say that I am proud to, you know, like my son is a Yurok tribal fisheries, you know, environmental engineer. You know what I mean? Like those, this passion is multi-generational, you know, and, and it starts with these kind of opportunities. And so I just want to say thank you to this organization for developing such an amazing product. Wow. Thank you, Maggie. And I can definitely say the same for you and your amazing children and the children that aren't even yours that you care for as your own. You know, I think that, that that's to say the same for you. Definitely inspired by everyone here to kind of try and pick and pull characteristics and traits that you all kind of um, set the stage for very um, humbling and inspiring on one um, but yeah as as with everything everyone probably has dinner cooking smelling good right about now so um, I do want to kind of uh, you know do last minute there's some links in the in the chat here if you are interested in accessing this curriculum um, there's links for that in the chat if you want to attend our um, teachers training um, do that. It's important to to be a part of those and having more inspiring conversations like tonight. And there's also other curriculum, the water protection series available on YouTube. There's just so many resources. Just check us out at californiasalmon.org. Um, and with that, you know, I'll let everyone be. And um, thanks everyone for joining us and hope you all have a good rest of the evening. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, everybody. So, Nick. Two.